Kayleys and Flings When you think of Scotland and music, the first thing most people will think of is the bagpipes. However, while bagpipes are an integral part of Scottish music and national identity, there is so much more to the rich tapestry of Scottish music and dance. While modern culture lumps Celtic into one grand mash, there are distinctive elements of some music that are definitely Scottish, while there are some that are Irish, Manx, Welsh, etc. There are also many common elements between them. I believe it does the body of work a disservice to ignore either the differences or the similarities. I therefore see Scottish music as a subset of a greater, richer tradition of Celtic music. Types of music Classical The Italian style of classical music probably came to Scotland in the 1720s when cellist and composer Lorenzo Bocci came to the country and developed settings for Lowland Scots songs. He may have helped with the first Scottish opera, The Gentle Shepherd, written by Alan Ramsay. Thomas Erskine, the sixth Earl of Kelly, was one of the more significant classical figures of this time, but his work was forgotten after his death and is just now becoming rediscovered. The 19th century saw the formation of the Scottish Orchestra, now the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. Sir Alexander Mackenzie wrote several works for violin, piano, and orchestra. Folk melodies have been developed for the orchestral performance by John McEwen. Classical music is definitely becoming more popular at the moment in Scotland. A new concert hall has just been built in Edinburgh, in the St. Cecilia Hall. Movie scores by Muir Matheson, Patrick Doyle, and Craig Armstrong have achieved international fame, while there is a festival of music every year on Orkney to celebrate the classical traditions. Each year, the Edinburgh International Festival attracts some of the most influential musicians of the world, and Scotland itself has inspired many notable artists today and in the past. One example is Mendelssohn, who wrote the Hebrides Overture in honor of his visit to the Outer Hebrides. Folk Music The earliest recorded non-religious music in Scotland was by John Forbes in 1662, Songs and Fancies, to THRE, Four, or Five Parties, both apt for voices and vials. It was printed three times over the next twenty years. It contained seventy-seven songs, twenty-five of which were Scottish. In the 18th century, many Scottish songs and tunes came into popularity, such as works by Robert Burns, Scotland's best-loved poet, and works by Sir Walter Scott. There are also many heroic ballads, poems, comical songs, and ancient songs. Of course, after 1745 and the collapse of the clan system, much of what was traditionally Scottish was banned by law through key laws such as the Dress Act 1746, the Act of Prescription 1746, and especially the Heritable Jurisdictions Act of 1746. All aspects of Highland culture, especially the Scottish language, were forbidden. These traditions had to go underground until Queen Victoria discovered the quaintness of Scotland and, once again, made it safe to be Scottish and proud. Revival the 20th century saw a great revival of interest in the ancient Scottish songs and ballads, and many musicians helped to bring them back to popularity. Collections were published, like Last Leaves of Traditional Ballads and Ballad Airs, which helped inspire musicians into playing these tunes. James Scott Skinner, the first international star of Celtic music, became known as the Strathspey King. Jeannie Robertson sang in Edinburgh, 1953, at the People's Festival. American singers began to sing folk music, such as Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger. This inspired some Scottish singers to do the same, such as Flora McNeil and John Strachan. This led to the 1960s, and folk music got a new, more modern, veneer. The Corys, the McCalmans, the Ian Campbell folk group, Alex Campbell and Dick Gaughan played in pipe bands in Strathspey and Real Societies. In the meantime, Irish folk bands, such as the Chieftains, helped make Celtic music popular around the world. Though Irish music became very popular in mainstream culture, Scottish folk music was still rarely heard on the radio or in pubs. It was this environment into which musicians such as Andy M. Stewart and his band, Silly Wizard, and rock artist Donovan entered. 
Silly Wizard took folk music and made it cool and continues to be popular. While Donovan was a mainstream artist, he was definitely using Celtic influence in his albums HMS Donovan and Open Road. Jack Bruce, one of the founders of Cream, was also heavily influenced by his hometown of Glasgow mixed with jazz, folk, blues, and rock elements. Another popular Scottish rock band, Renrig, from the Isle of Skye, has been going strong for 40 years now and has strong popularity in Scotland, the UK, Canada, and Germany. Other bands, such as the Whistlebinkies, Albanac, the Clutha, the Incredible String Band, Tannehill Weavers, Shugla Nifty, and the Peat Bog Fairies worked, and continue to work, in a fusion of traditional Celtic music with rock, bagpipes with electric guitars, drums, fiddles and harp. One of the most poignant and heartbreaking songs I've heard was Caledonia by Dougie McLean. It makes me cry in homesickness when I've never truly lived in Scotland. Popular. Perhaps Scotland isn't the first country that springs to mind when you think of pop or rock music. However, this country has certainly produced many notable talents. Annie Lennox of the Eurythmics came onto the scene in the 1980s and continues to make powerful music with her haunting voice. The Bay City Rollers was probably the largest Scottish pop act of the 1970s in terms of sales. Sheena Easton who also went on to have a short-lived acting career. Many of the members of ACDC were born in Scotland, including Bon Scott and Malcolm and Angus Young. Simple Minds The Jesus and Mary Chain Big Country The Proclaimers of 500 Miles Fame Julie Fowlis, her beautiful voice can be recently heard on the Brave soundtrack. David Burns, lead singer of The Talking Heads. Jerry Rafferty, Baker Street and Right Down the Line being international hits. Al Stewart, best known for his international hit, Year of the Cat. Leon Jackson, won the X Factor competition at 19 years of age with his wide range and Michael Bublé voice. Primal Scream, Delamitri, Travis, and many more. Rod Stewart, probably the most famous performer in the world of close Scottish descent. The Instruments The Bagpipes The bagpipe has long been an indelible symbol of Scotland, the people, and their pride in the nation. Having been banned for many years as dangerous, possibly due to the 1746 Prescription Act, the Scots today hold fiercely to their restored symbol. They still carry them into battle, they did so in World War II, to their regiment mates chagrin, and refused to forsake them. There are different types of bagpipes, but most people are familiar with the Great Highland Bagpipes, Piedvor, and indeed, the sound from a properly played pipe is impressive and moving. While it was developed in Scotland, there are bagpipe traditions in many parts of the Celtic world, including Ireland, Northern Spain, Galicia, and Wales. The earliest bagpipe references are from the 15th century, but they could have been used as early as the 6th century. They were used for formal ceremonies, military marches, and were often used in hereditary clans such as the MacArthas, MacDonalds, Mackays, and the MacCrimmons. The music from the bagpipes was originally called Pyobariact, which means piping in Gaelic. It has also been called Keol Moor, or Great Music. Other music, such as strathspeys, reels, jigs and hornpipes, became popular later as examples of light music. Harp and Fiddle Stringed instruments have been known in Scotland since at least the Iron Age. Lyres were found on the Isle of Skye dating from 2300 BCE, Europe's oldest surviving stringed instrument. The Scottish clarsac, or harp, was pretty much regarded as the national instrument. However, it was displaced by the bagpipes sometime around the 15th century. Stone carvings indicate that the harp was known by and used by the Picts, perhaps even before the 9th century. An oral tradition meant that poets and storytellers were highly respected, as they were holders of genealogies, histories, and legends. They were honored at all levels, and to kill a bard was a grievous sin. 
They were usually the highest advisor to the king and often worked as historians, genealogists, and experts on the Brehan Law, as well. Brehan Law was a complex system of legal rules that permeated Celtic culture. Some modern harp players include Severna Stevenson, Maggie McInnes, and the band, Sheilas. A CD from Sheilas, Beating Harps, was one of my first purchases of Celtic music, and I was instantly hooked. Scottish traditional fiddling has many regional styles, including the upbeat styles of the Northern Isles and the slow airs of the Northeast. The instrument probably arrived in the 17th century from mainland Europe and has become an integral part of the Scottish music tradition. Scottish and Irish fiddling was the precursor to the Appalachian fiddling in the United States and has also been parent to the fiddling of Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. Musicians such as Natalie McMaster have brought the style to a worldwide stage. I saw Natalie McMaster at a Dublin Irish festival where she brought her five children on stage to fiddle and dance. Accordion Thanks mostly to the work of Phil Cunningham, whose piano accordion was an essential ingredient in Silly Wizard, many artists have begun to use this instrument in both folk and rock music in Scotland. The melodeon was popular in the early 20th century, especially among country folk, and was considered part of the Bothy band tradition. Bothy bands came from the farming culture of 19th century Scotland, from the small communities that formed in clusters of cottages. Tin Whistle While usually associated with Ireland, Scotland also has a tradition of the tin whistle, and has been found with pottery dating as far back as the 14th and 15th centuries. It is common for pipers and flute players to also play the tin whistle. A single tin whistle, well played, can be the most haunting and wistful sound one has heard. The dancing. The piping tradition is strongly tied to both the traditional step dance of the highlands and the singing, much of which mimics the sounds of the bagpipes. Highland balls are still rather more frequent than you might expect, and of course weddings and other celebrations are everywhere. A Cayley, country dance or party, is common, especially in the smaller villages. There are group dances, similar to the line and square dancing that is popular in America. Indeed, this is likely where it originated, with Highlanders having emigrated to areas such as Virginia and South Carolina in the mid-18th century. Typically, there will be a fiddler, perhaps some other instruments, and, rather than a caller, there is a set sequence of moves to any given tune. These dances include line promenades, corners, weaving in and out, all similar to square dancing. A traditional form of Scottish dancing is the Highland Fling, or the Sword Dance. Typically, if you've been to any sort of Highland games, you will have seen flocks of preteen girls in pastel-colored checkered stockings and skirts, one arm on their hip and another in the air, hopping about on one foot and then the other in a set pattern. Traditionally, there are two swords on the ground, in a crossed pattern. This dance was traditionally done before a battle, and usually by a man, if the dancer could complete the steps without stepping on a sword, they would be victorious. The songs. Vocal music is very traditional to Scotland, especially the ballads and laments, sung by a lone singer, with or without accompaniment. There is a tradition of port obule, or mouth music, traditionally sung solo without instruments, and consists of rhymes in a set pattern, perhaps originally for helping the rhythm during the work of mashing the barley, or walking the wool, cleaning the wool. These are also called bothy songs, as men working together on farms lived in a bothy, cottage. Julie Fowlis does some lovely portobule songs, as does Sheilas. Now that you understand a little of the history behind the music, you will want to sing along with some of these rousing jigs and sad ballads at the pub, right? Don't feel shy, people do it all the time. Sad songs, Bid Clan Alid, Beloved Gregor, Green Grow the Rushes O. Oh. Thomas the Rhymer, The Cruel Mother, Tam Lin, Amazing Grace, Auld Lang Syne, C.A. the Youse, Caledonia. Happy songs, or at least enthusiastic Donald Wears Your Trussers, Mary's Wedding, Nancy Whiskey, Hame Drunk Kim I, Jock Stewart, Blue Blazing Blind Drunk, do you sense a theme here? Rebel songs, The Flowers of the Forest, The Campbells Are Coming, Heelan Laddie, Johnny Cope, 
Killy Cranky, Ye Jacobites by Name, A Song to the Prince, The Sky Boat Song, Will Ye No Come Back Again, Both Sides of the Tweed, Won't Be King But Charlie, Why A Hundred Pipers, Charlie Is My Darling, The Highland Widow's Lament, Arthur McBride. Love Songs, The Queen of Argyle, M. Y. Love Is Like a Red, Red Rose, Wild Mountain Time, The Bleacher Lassie, O. Kelvin Haw, The Road and the Miles to Dundee, The Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond, The Banks O. Red Roses. Boffy Songs, The Roven Plowboy, McPherson's Rant, The Bonnie Ship the Diamond, The Geisby Laddies, Johnny Abredisley. Some are simply tunes, rather than songs, Lament for the Children, Black-Haired Lad, A Piper's Warning to His Master, A Call in Maroon, Mac Crimmins' Sweetheart, Cradle Song. Of course, on any typical pub night, you may hear many Irish and American songs sprinkled in with Scottish favorites. Just because the tune is from another land, doesn't mean people don't like it. I've often heard Country Roads, West Virginia, Daydream Believer, and Piano Man at pub sings. Finding the Music a Scot of poetic temperament, and without religious exultation, drops as if by nature into the public house, but what else is a man to do in this dog's weather? Robert Louis Stevenson Pubs are the community living room in Scotland. It's a place where people gather to relax, socialize, and talk about their day. Perhaps they complain about the weather, share some funny stories, toast a pint, and listen to some music. You can find them in every size and description across the country. Do keep in mind that not all have music, not all serve food, often this stops around 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., and none allow smoking, since 2006, inside. Sometimes there is an outdoor beer garden to accommodate those who must light up. Children can be welcome in the early evenings, and sometimes well-behaved dogs as well in some of the country establishments. While you must be 18 to purchase alcohol, children as young as 14 are welcome if the pub has a children's license, as long as they don't drink alcohol. That child must be accompanied by an adult and may be restricted to certain areas, such as the restaurant area of the pub. Once the food is no longer served, however, the children are no longer allowed in the area. Pubs, especially in the less populated areas, might not be open during mid-afternoon hours, say between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. Some may close for the winter season. If you are in a particularly Protestant area, such as the Wee Free Islands and the Outer Hebrides, they may be closed all day on Sunday. Do some research before your trip so you aren't disappointed. This isn't based on law, but custom, so your mileage may vary. Perhaps finding a pub with music isn't quite as easy in Scotland as it is in Ireland, but it's still not difficult if you're in the countryside rather than a city. There are several website resources I've listed in the appendix that might help you find the perfect pub for some lovely Scottish music, including that of the Traditional Music and Song Association of Scotland. They have a list of local folk festivals as well as the pub sessions. A session could mean a solo performer, a group of 20 taking turns or playing together, or anything in between. These are not usually professional performers, but locals who just love playing, and often tourists joining in. Their performances are not polished, but they are genuine in a way that set shows are not. If you bring your own instrument and or your voice, you will be welcome to join. Music likely won't start until around 9 or 10 p.m. each night, but do get there earlier, as space is at a premium. We prefer to find BNBS that are within staggering distance of a pub with music, so there are no worries of drinking and driving. Most advertised traditional Scottish nights in the bigger hotels are staged performances, with dancers and singers with honed skills. They may be slick professional performers, but they're still fun. Some of the places in Edinburgh known for good traditional music include Sandy Bell's, Royal Oak Bar and the Wee Folk Club. Literature, Shows and Movies Many books, television shows, and movies have made their home in Scotland. Not only those based on the rich history of the land, but those with some fantasy or literary license. I've listed a few of them below, with a list of places where you can visit scenes from the work.
While the scope of this book is not large enough to make an exhaustive list, I've listed some of my favorites. Movies Brave, while Brave is an animated film, much of the animation was based on real locations in Scotland, such as the Callanish Standing Stones on the Isle of Lewis. Dunatar Castle and Glen Affric provided inspiration for the animators as well. Braveheart, various historic locations, such as Stirling and Edinburgh, are portrayed in the film. While some footage includes Glen Nevis, Glencoe, Loch Nevin, and Fort William, much of the movie was filmed in Ireland due to weather difficulties in Scotland. The Da Vinci Code, bringing Rosslyn Chapel into the limelight, this thriller has played an important part in a resurgence of interest in this exquisite chapel. Chariots of Fire, if you walk the West Sands Beach in St. Andrews, you will walk in the footsteps of the actors in this Oscar-winning film. Edinburgh and SMA Glen were also used as locations. Entrapment, Duart Castle is the home of the Maclean clan and located on the Isle of Mole. It was used in this film with Sean Connery and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Eileen Donan Castle was also used for some shots. Harry Potter, most people will be familiar with the Glenfinnan Aqueduct due to the many panning shots of the Hogwarts Express shooting across the scenic place. The castle itself is constructed of several other castles, with added animations. Glencoe, Loch Shiel, Loch Eilt, and Loch Morar are also used as filming locations. Highlander, this film, and the subsequent television series and sequels, use many parts of the Highlands in filming. Island Donan Castle is the most recognizable location used on the set of the original movie, starring Christopher Lambert and Sean Connery. Other parts of the film were shot in Skye, Loch Shiel, and Glencoe. Local Hero, this feel-good film was mostly filmed in Pennon, Aberdeenshire and on Camusterac Beach, in Morar. Banff and Loch Tarf also played host to the movie sets. Monty Python and the Holy Grail, most of the castle scenes in this comedy were filmed at Dune Castle, except near the end. Castle Stalker was used for Castle of Arg. Rannock Moor and Glencoe were also used, as well as Arnhall Castle, Sheriff Near, Loch Tay, and the Duke's Pass. Rob Roy, this film starring Liam Neeson was historically set in Balquader. The film, however, used Meginch Castle, Crichton Castle, Glencoe, Glen Nevis, Rannock Moor, and Glen Tarbot. Skyfall, James Bond fans will remember the last part of the film, where they search for a place out of reach of all technology, and end up in Scotland. The area this part was filmed in is known Bookill out of Moor, near Glencoe, and is noted for its stark beauty and desolation. Another James Bond film, The World Is Not Enough, used Eileen Donan Castle as well. Train Spotting, this cult classic is mostly filmed in Glasgow, though the story was set in Edinburgh. Some filming was done out in Rannock Moor, near Glencoe. The Wicker Man, a cult film from the 1970s, the towns of Gatehouse of Fleet, Newton Stewart, Cree Town and Kirkubri were used for filming in the Dumfries and Galloway regions. Plockton, St. Ninian's Cave and Colzine Castle in Ayrshire was also used for some of the film. Television Series Hamish Macbeth the town of Loch Dove is fictitious, but it was filmed in Plockton, Kyle of Lokolsh and the surrounding area. It stars Robert Carlyle as a rather peevish lone police officer in a small highland town. The setting of the town itself is stunning. Monarch of the Glen The scenery in this show has been described as one of the main characters. Set in fictional Glen Bogle, the filming was done at Ardvariki Estate, a massive turreted manor house in the Highlands. While the house is not open to the public, private tours can sometimes be arranged, and the gatehouse, also in the show, is available to rent as a self-catering property. Lagan is the town that is used, and Kingussie, Carbridge and Broomhill Station make appearances. The river Pat Tack is used for many scenes. Outlander, by Diana Gabaldon. These books are mostly set in Scotland and have many locations both in the books and the television series filming. Castle Leod, home of the clan Mackenzie becomes Castle Leoch in the show, filmed at Castle Dune. 
Clava Cairn Stone Circle was the basis for Craig Na Dunn. Other locations in the books include Edinburgh Castle, Culloden Field, and Inverness. The filming locations include Falkland Palace, Blackness Castle, Midhope Castle, and Colross Palace and Abbey. Rebus Based on Ian Rankin's Inspector Rebus novels. The series aired with two seasons starring John Hanna, but after a hiatus, Ken Stott took over as Inspector Rebus for two more seasons. Set in and around Edinburgh, these seasons were typically two-hour episodes within a four-episode season, also known as mini-series. What makes these mini-series different from the typical mini-series is they ran over four seasons, rather than just one season as typical for these types of programs. Taggart A police procedural program based in Strathclyde, a suburb of Glasgow. This has been a long-running series which began in 1983, starring Mark McManus as DCI Jim Taggart until his death in 1994. The series ran until 2010 under the same name, despite that there no longer was a DCI Taggart in the program. Books slash authors Ian Banks Banks, who died in 2013, was a Scottish author whose books have been adapted in theater, radio, and television, and he has been honored many times by the science fiction and mainstream writing communities. He was born in Dunfermline, Fife, and set many of his books in Edinburgh. Tony Black Edinburgh-based crime writer Popular for the Gus Drury series he was an award-winning journalist, with works appearing in many UK papers and periodicals. Since turning his hand to fiction, he's become one of Edinburgh's most revered crime writers of the 21st century, earning him fans such as Ian Rankin for the Inspector Rebus series and Irvine Welsh for Train Spotting. Robert Burns Burns is known as the Bard in Scotland and lived in the 18th century. He is celebrated worldwide and regarded as Scotland's national poet. He lived near the town of Ayr in Ayrshire, and the house he lived in is now the Burns Cottage Museum. He also lived in Tarbalton, Mochline, Dumfries, and Edinburgh. Dorothy Dinnett Best known for her historical fiction series The Lyman Chronicles, Dinnett lived in Edinburgh. Her novels took place mostly along the borders of Scotland but ranged widely across the world. Diana Gabaldon Outlander novels, see the entry in the television series section above. Neil Gunn Born in Dunbath, Caithness, Gunn moved south to Kirkcud Brightshire. His novels and stories were influential with many modern writers. Compton Mackenzie Best known for his novels Whiskey Galore set in the Hebrides and Monarch of the Glen set in the Scottish Highlands, Mackenzie was actually born in England, but remained fiercely proud of his Scottish ancestry. Karen Marie Moaning Moaning has several historical fiction novels set during the more evocative of times throughout Scottish history, novelizing famous events such as the Glencoe Massacre, among others. Ian Rankin Rankin hails from Fife, but his Inspector Rebus series is mostly set in Edinburgh, where he now lives. Kate Robbins Author of the Highland Chief series, Robbins has some steamy romances set in the highlands of Scotland. J. K. Rowling Harry Potter novels, see the entry in the movies section above. Sir Walter Scott Timeless classics such as Ivanhoe and Rob Roy are part of the rich heritage Sir Walter Scott leaves for the world. He was born near the grass market in Edinburgh, though lived in the borders for a time. Many of his novels are thus set in the city, or in the romantic highlands. Waverley, for instance, was set in the highlands as a tale of the Jacobite Rising of 1745. Robert Louis Stevenson the author of Kidnapped, Treasure Island, and Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde should need no introduction. His novels have been inspiration for generations of novelists and storytellers. He was born and lived in Edinburgh, though he traveled in search of health many times. Nigel Tranter While he began as a writer about the history of castles, Tranter explores characters in his Bruce Trilogy, McGregor Trilogy and Master of Grey Trilogy. Stunning Shots 
How better to capture the moment, the memory, the mood, than to take a photograph of the stunning vista you see before you on your trip to Scotland? One of the eternal draws of this island to millions of tourists are the beautiful sights which are everywhere, and it takes very little time, if any, to travel from one stunning landscape to the next. It's all contained in a compact, green package, ready to share with your envious loved ones. Photographs provide a great service to both the photographer and his friends and family. They record the memory to share and to relive later. There are many times I've looked back on my photos and remembered a scene I had forgotten, relived a memory I had lost. This is also a reason I write my trip reports in such detail, I know my own memory is rather faulty, so I jot down notes every time I sit down to eat during the trip. This helps me write down the narrative later and keeps my memory strong years afterwards. It also helps me realize where I took some of the photographs. The preparation. While there may be a few out there still using film, most people take digital photographs now, and most of those use their phone rather than a camera. If you are still on film, then some of this advice must be adjusted for this fact, so keep this in mind. However, one of the biggest advantages of digital photography is the ability to take as many photographs as you have memory space for, and sort later the ones you wish to spend money on printing. A decent digital camera before you leave deserves a bit of research. I'm not much of a movie taker, but some people prefer video to photographs. If so, much of this will also apply to the video recorder shopping. The Equipment not everyone needs or wants a professional-grade camera. These can cost over $5,000, and most people don't have this in the budget. Even high-grade amateur cameras, which usually run between $400 and $1,000, are outside most people's budget and desire. However, a decent amateur camera can be gotten for about $150 to $200 and, in my opinion, are well worth the investment. You should, however, do your research and decide which camera is right for you. If you are not planning on printing your photographs in huge sizes for hanging on the wall, your smartphone camera should be sufficient. There is an excellent site at Digital Photograph Review which allows you to choose cameras by feature and compare them side by side. I have used it many times to choose my next piece of equipment. You will need to decide which features are important to you. Since I take a lot of landscape shots, and often from the window of a moving car, long optical zoom and fast shutter speed are very important to me. The ability to shoot in RAW format, which doesn't let the camera do any editing of the image, is also important to me, as I do a lot of post-production manipulation in Photoshop. Is low-light photography important to you, for night shots or party shots? How about close-ups for flowers and other macro photography? Once you know what is important, you are ready to choose a decent camera. By the way, some of the best shots I've taken have been from a point-and-shoot $80 camera. Good equipment is helpful but is not essential. The art is truly in the eye of the artist, not the equipment they use. The Accessories Many cameras come with interchangeable lenses, one for macro, one for zoom, etc. The higher-end professional cameras have this as a matter of course. The point-and-shoots do not, for the most part. The rest of us are in the middle. My camera of choice right now is the Nikon Coolpix P900, which does not have a removable lens. The installed lens can zoom 83x and can do a decent macro shot. I'm happy with this range and would rather not mess with multiple lenses. This is my personal choice, and it may not be yours, so experiment with a few. Go to the store, pick up the camera with all its accessories. Do you want to be hiking up a mountain and through an airport, carrying all this? Or is it worth it to you? Memory, 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 without it, you are done with your digital diary. Uploading to the cloud might not always be practical. There are several options to making sure you have enough on your trip. Memory sticks of any type are pretty cheap. 
My option this last trip was simply to take enough sticks to make sure I never ran out of room. I never came close, even after 9,900 photos. I always, always, however, take at least one more than I think I will need, in case one gets corrupted or lost. Another option I've done in the past is take a laptop and download the card each night. This is fine if you are already planning on taking a laptop, not so much if you'd rather not carry the extra weight. It's worth a note to say if you do, for some reason, accidentally erase the photos from your card, don't despair. Also, don't touch it. Don't try to take more pictures on it, save it until you can get in touch with an expert, he she should be able to get most of the data from it. My friend Carla did this on our trip to Scotland, 1,200 photos erased in the blink of an eye. She held on to it, and when she returned, she was able to get back about 90% of those precious memories she captured with the help of a data recovery specialist. The Method Scotland is truly a land of wonders. It is not a large place, but it is packed with stunning seascapes, sandy beaches, rocky forts, romantic ruins, and bucolic pastures. When I went to Scotland in June of 2008, in 23 days, I had racked up over 5,000 photos. I believe in the theory you take as many photos as you possibly can on site, as you can always sift through them later. Different perspectives, different lighting, and different levels, a couple will turn out well. You can't as easily go back and revisit the site. Even the few times I have revisited a place and took a photograph, I've discovered the landscape has changed. Traveling to the Isle of Skye in 2000, and then again in 2008, parts of it looked completely different due to construction, time, and weather. In Scotland, you are tempted to stop every five minutes on your journey to take a photo of the lamb nursing by the side of the road, the ruin on the hill, the charming thatched cottage on the road. Go ahead and do it! Do it safely, mind, there are usually small laybys or pullouts, which you can turn into for a very short period, don't park there, they are for passing, not parking, or driveways you can turn into. This is a country made for photo opportunities, after all. After you've seen your hundredth sheep or so, you may be less tempted to stop at the sight of each one. You should keep in mind some basic photography truths, but also keep in mind these are rules, and rules are sometimes meant to be broken. The rule of thirds, composition is more interesting when objects and horizon lines are on the top or bottom third of the picture, or the left slash right third. Lines, roads, fences, and other lines lead the eye into a particular spot, make sure the spot has something interesting. Scale, the mountain photo is great, but how big is it? Take a shot with a flower, tree, or cottage in the foreground to lend a perspective of scale. Weather, the weather in Scotland is part of the landscape. Use it to your advantage. There's a storm coming in, wouldn't a dark cloud look dramatic over the castle? Move your body until you can get the shot lined up right. And then run for the car before the deluge hits. Perspective, more interesting points of view can change the feel of a photo. Shooting straight up on a castle wall or a tree, or down on a flower can work wonders. Action, a standing sheep is lovely, but getting a lamb while it nurses, or a pony while running makes the photo much more interesting. Lighting, sunrise and sunset, storms and clouds, and the ever-present mists of Scotland can make some amazing atmospheric shots. One reason I like staying in one place for several days is to have several opportunities to take photos at different times of the day and night. The Locations while all of Scotland is picturesque and charming, and different people like different things, there are certain places, subjects and areas which stand out as being incredibly photogenic. Cliffs, Scotland is rugged and rough in its landscape and has a long and varied coastline. My favorite place in the world is to be on a sea cliff, looking down at the ocean crashing upon the rocks far below me. I love the mix of sea, wind, and earth, and I feel like I'm standing on the edge of the earth. As a result, I take many of my photographs in such spots. 
whether it is Kilt Rock on the Isle of Skye, or the fine sandy beach at Luskintyre on the Isle of Lewis, or the hexagonal rocks on the Isle of Staffa, I love the places where the water meets the land. Water, locks and rivers have coastlines as well, and Scotland certainly has its share of picturesque places along its waterways. The country is practically split in half by one. Many large lakes, such as Loch Lomond, Loch Tay, or the Lake of Menteith have stunning scenery to capture. Castles, Scotland has hundreds of castles, ranging from grand palaces which will rent you a room for the night, to crumbling ruins which barely hold a full wall against the tide of time. Each is unique and has photographic charm of its own. Some areas are more castle-rich than others, such as Aberdeen and its castle trail, but there are random ruins wherever you go. Some seemingly don't even have a name, it being lost in time. Today, they are just a nuisance to the local farmer who cannot farm this part of the land. Critters, sheep, highland cows, goats, donkeys, chickens, and horses. There are more, but these are what I see most of in Scotland. Sheep, and some more sheep. And look, there are some sheep. And a horse. And more sheep. If you are visiting in April or May, you will see adorable lambs running after their mothers, looking for lunch. Cities, Edinburgh is a jewel in the crown of the world, with beautiful architecture, but don't discount Glasgow. While it has had a reputation in the past for being the workaday poor cousin of Edinburgh, it has revamped itself into a city of culture and art. Inverness, in my opinion, is more a base to explore the highlands, but it has its charms as well. Aberdeen is known as the Granite City, showing off many buildings that sparkle in the sun after the rain. There are throngs of people going about their merry day to photograph, and unique sites such as the commanding castles in Stirling and Edinburgh, and the People's Palace in Glasgow. Flowers, Scotland has many incredible gardens, ranging from the formal gardens in Glasgow to those in countryside castles, like Inverary or Dunvegan. Most cottages and houses have small, well-tended flower gardens in their homes, and the Scots take pride in these miniature beauties. Purple heather will shine through in the autumn, while wildflowers are lovely among the green throughout the spring and summer. Cottages, ah, the charming, thatched cottage. They transport you back to imagined romantic past lives, filled with peat smoke and traditional music. In reality, many of these are becoming impractical, but the Scots realize their tourism draw and preserve those which are left for the teeming tours of photographers. There are several folk villages that preserve these places of history so you can see what it was like to live in such a place. People, ever friendly, the people of Scotland are usually game for posing for a photograph. Especially if they are red-haired with freckles or wearing a kilt, you won't be the first to ask them. Often, after a few pints in a pub, they'll not say no. Do be respectful, though, these folk are trying to go about their day, and some are quite busy with their lives. Stones, yes, stones. Scotland is a very rocky country. And while the cliffs are made of stone, so are the Neolithic burial sites, the stone circles, the Aga memorials, the Pictish towers, and the Celtic crosses. There is great texture and pattern in stones of all types. The north, in particular, has many of these, but they dot the entire land. Churches, Scotland has a strange dichotomy in religion, with the Catholic Highlanders and the wee Free Islands, but there are still lovely churches to both belief systems around the country. Larger communities may have temples or churches of other faiths, such as Muslim, Jewish, Methodist, etc. Many are also abbeys in ruins since medieval times. Either way, they are an important part of the cultural and physical landscape of the land. Kilts, okay, so I have a soft spot for men in kilts, and Scotland is the one place where you can actually see men dressed in them randomly on the street. Not part of a Renaissance festival, Scottish festival, or part of a play, just normal everyday men walking to work, to church, to school. It's not everywhere, mind you, but it is often enough that you will see it fairly frequently, especially if you get up higher into the North Highlands. 
A note about pests. Some of the best shots will be early morning and late afternoon, due to the incredible light. However, Scotland only has a few mosquitoes, which most people are well familiar with. Much more annoying are the swarms of biting midges. Midges are tiny, biting flies, smaller than gnats. This means they get through most mosquito netting, and they fly in swarms. They are most prevalent in the highlands and isles, and during dawn and dusk. I've used skin so soft to good effect in repelling them. Wind also helps, but it's more difficult to command the weather gods. Whatever you do, do not be afraid of walking off the beaten path. Climb into the forest, up a rock, into a graveyard, around a stone wall, the possibilities are endless. Of course, be aware of your surroundings and dress appropriately for your adventures. Bring what supplies are required, such as walking sticks, sturdy shoes, water and food, etc. If you are truly adventurous, go on a mountain walk, please, with an experienced guide. Keep in mind some sites, such as the Tomb of the Eagles, are only accessible if you walk through someone's yard or field. This is allowed but do be respectful with the owner's permission, as this may be a working farm or other place of business, and do no harm to the property. The Aftermath Inevitably, you get home and look at your photos, and you are disappointed. You remember it being much more breathtaking than the photo could capture. This is, unfortunately, due to the limitations of modern technology. While today's cameras are incredible, they still are not the human eye, and can only capture a thin slice of the wonder we see with our own incredibly complex eye structure. Even the eye cannot truly see all our mind imagines when we look upon a fantasy landscape like Scotland. Our imagination fills in the fairy hills and standing stones with mystery and wonder. Our eye only sees part of this, and the camera captures even less of it. One of the reasons I unapologetically manipulate my photographs is I want to share what my mind saw at the location, not what my eyes saw, or what the camera captured. I want to share this with those who couldn't be there to experience it with me. It's a tall order and sometimes very difficult to accomplish, but I work at it until I am mostly satisfied with my results. I usually print my photos in small format first, to see how they come out in that format, the computer screen sometimes isn't the best portrayal of print photograph. I then order the prints larger to sell. I use a company called White House Custom Copies. You can upload your photos to their server and receive them a couple days later. I've never had a problem with WHCC, and their customer service is top-notch. I've also printed canvas prints with Simply Canvas and books and calendars at Lulu. There are many ways to share your memories with those you love. Haggis and Cullen Skink Like their downstairs neighbor, Scotland has long had a reputation for boring and tasteless food. However, once they realized that they had a wealth of natural game, produce and spices, and stopped exporting all the yummy stuff to England, Scotland experienced a renaissance in cuisine and now take great pride in it. Perhaps having had the old alliance with France helped, and the Scots have begun to send their chefs to France to learn the techniques. They come back and use the fantastic local ingredients, with wonderful results. Now, you will still get street food and takeaway places, but the high-end restaurants will not leave you wanting. Takeaway is a great way to experience fantastic ethnic food. Some of the best Indian food I've ever had was at Scottish takeaway joints in Orkney and Lewis, and a fantastic sit-down Indian restaurant in Edinburgh. Breakfasts If you are staying at bed and breakfasts, you will be served a fantastic breakfast by your hosts. One option is almost always the full Scottish breakfast, also known as the all-day breakfast. This starts off with an egg, usually fried, but it can often be poached or scrambled by choice. Then a bit of fried or grilled bacon is added. This is not like American bacon, it's more like a slice of fatty ham, much thicker than ours, almost a fattier version of Canadian bacon. They call our type streaky bacon. 
Add a couple of link sausage, these are usually not very spicy or peppery. Black pudding, a slice of sausage made with grains, spices, and pig's blood. White pudding, like the black pudding, but without the blood, and made with different spices. Grilled half tomato. Grilled mushrooms. Baked beans. Fried bread, sliced white bread fried in the flavored oil used to prepare the rest of the breakfast. Haggis, try it! It is the national dish. Haggis is a spicy, grain-filled sausage, traditionally made with sheep offal and cooked in a sheep's stomach. While modern commercial versions use higher quality meats, traditionally handmade haggis should definitely be experienced. It is, if done right, very tasty and moist. Robert Burns even wrote a dress to a haggis, which is trotted out and performed at Robert Burns' suppers each year. Other options may include smoked salmon with scrambled eggs, porridge, aka oatmeal, various cold cereals, fresh and stewed slash canned fruit, poached eggs. In addition, there is coffee, tea, milk, and often several types of juice available. Sometimes there are homemade jams and jellies, scones, or pancakes as well. Occasionally, I've had muesli, or a mixed fruit slash grain slash cream concoction that was delicious. Now you know why the full Scottish breakfast is also called the all-day breakfast. You will not go away hungry from a Scottish breakfast, and most likely, you won't be hungry again until 2 or 3 p.m., at which point, most places will no longer be serving lunch. So, eat less and have a normal lunch time, or be prepared with snacks to keep you until dinner. Food Western civilization is extremely food-oriented. We meet for lunch, we meet for drinks. If we have someone over as a guest, we offer them a drink, and we sit down for a dinner party. Barbecues and picnics are how families meet up. We obsess about our weight, our presentation, the taste, style, and healthiness of food, everything associated with the act of eating. So how do the Scottish do all of this? My restaurant of choice in Scotland, or anywhere else in Great Britain or Ireland, is the pub. Sometimes this is because it's the only thing open at 2 or 3 p.m. serving food by the time I've worked off the huge Scottish breakfast. Also, the food is fairly inexpensive, and gastropubs have raised the bar on quality food. Traditionally, pubs have been primarily for drinking, with a packet of crisps, potato chips, pork scratching, pork rinds, or peanuts as an afterthought. Some pubs served pies in a pint, the pies being meat and potatoes encased in pastry and baked and held in the hand to eat. Now, traditional pub grub can include those same meat pies, plus hearty stews, fish and chips, carvery roasts, and whatever the pub's chef can conjure up on the day. A plowman's lunch, bits of cheese, relish or pickle, leftover carved roast from the previous day, and some bread, is a holdover from this time. While many pubs have their own signature meals on their menu, there are certain dishes you will usually always find at almost any pub worth its salt in Scotland. Fish and chips, originally brought to the British Isles by Italian immigrants, this dish has become synonymous with England, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland. Flaky white fish, usually cod or whiting, is battered and deep-fried, and served thick-cut chips, fries. Mussels, especially in the coast areas, mussels are a staple, most often served in a white wine and garlic sauce, and a side of traditional brown bread and butter. Steak and ale pie, a thick, dark savory type of stew loaded with chunks of beef, potato, carrot baked in a flaky pastry, I've also seen it with lamb, known as lamb and ale pie. Deep-fried mushrooms, coated in batter or crumbs, and deep-fried. Often with an awali sauce slash garlic mayo. Goat's cheese salad, sometimes the cheese is coated in crumbs then fried, sometimes baked, sometimes cold. Usually served on salad greens with a sweet chutney of some sort, like cranberry compote. Soups, unless it is a stew, it will likely be pureed. Vegetable soup, potato soup, mushroom soup, unless the menu lists clear soup, you are more than likely to be served a creamy puree, so be aware. 
Adding to the creaminess, almost always, fresh cream is also added either in the blending process or by spoon at the end, you'll see swirls of white in the soup. Shepherd's pie, savory mince slash ground lamb and vegetables topped with mashed potatoes and baked until the potatoes are golden. Cottage pie is most often offered in tourist establishments. This is the same as shepherd's pie but is made with beef rather than lamb. Burgers, yes, lots of burgers. Those served in upscale eateries are made with high-quality beef and lots of topping choices. Takeaways also offer burgers on their menu, which are highly processed. Chicken sandwiches are becoming very popular. Scallops, the Scottish love their scallops, and they are delicious. Occasionally, I've actually gotten them with the roe still attached. Smoked salmon, usually served with traditional brown bread and butter, perhaps some capers or dill dressing. Scotch eggs, hard-boiled eggs deep-fried in a crust of sausage and breadcrumbs. If done right, it's delicious. Curry and chips, try it. I was skeptical at first, but curry makes an excellent sauce for your chips. Prom cocktail with Marie Rose sauce, unlike the tomatoey sauce in America, Marie Rose sauce is made from mayonnaise and ketchup, sometimes with a little Worcestershire sauce. Small prawns are added to the sauce and mixed well, then served on a bed of lettuce or in a small bowl. Bangers and mash, sausage and mashed potatoes, what can be better? Toad in the hole, a sausage baked in a Yorkshire pudding, covered in gravy. Sticky toffee pudding, a steamed sponge cake made with chopped dates, covered in a butter rum toffee sauce, usually served warm. Cranican, a traditional dessert with raspberries, toasted oats, cream, honey, and whiskey. Bread and butter pudding, traditional bread pudding, made with chunks of stale bread in an eggy custardy mix with cinnamon or allspice, most often with raisins, and served with a whiskey sauce, and warm pouring custard on the side. Banafee pie, as the name implies, banana and toffee made into a creamy pie. Onto a cookie crumb base, fresh sliced bananas are layered, then the creamy banana toffee cream is poured on and refrigerated until set. It's served with generous lashings of fresh whipped cream and drizzles of toffee sauce on top, and chocolate shavings, and sometimes chopped fresh nuts. Some pubs have different items, of course, and the fancier they want to look, the more haute they try to make their cuisine. I've seen a couple failed efforts here and there, but for the most part, the gastropubs, and even those regular pubs that care, do a pretty good job firing up the food. If you would rather not eat at the pub, the normal restaurants are great, as well. I'm a big fan of seafood, and Scotland has wonderful dishes made with salmon, prawns, mackerel, mussels, scallops, oysters, and anything else you can imagine. Scottish beef is top-notch, but I usually go for the lamb, as it is more difficult to find in the U.S., and it is everywhere on the menu in Scotland. Their ethnic restaurants tend to be delicious as well, some of the best Indian and Chinese food I've had has been in Ireland and Scotland. Street food is also an option, I've had pancakes, crepes, fish and chips, chips and curry, and gyros served roadside in mobile food vans or you can get supplies at the grocery store and snack on the road. If you are staying in a self-catering place, you will have a full kitchen to make your own creations. Here are some other traditional treats you might find and try. Angus beef, Scotland is world famous for its high-quality Aberdeen Angus beef, and most pubs will serve it as steaks and as burgers and are proud of saying so. Our Broth Smokies, these are a flavorful sausage made using traditional methods dating back to the 1880s. Bannocks, a type of quick bread. It varies in size slightly, from about the same thickness as a scone, to a sort of a flat griddle cake. They were useful for a quick snack out on the moors and stayed fresh all day. Cockaleeky soup, as the name implies, this is chicken and leek soup. The traditional method of making this soup would have also included slices of prunes in the broth. Cullen skink, a thick Scottish chowder made with smoked haddock, potatoes, and onions. Keep in mind this is smoked fish, so it has a nice, strong taste. 
Deep fried Mars bar, the Scots will deep fry anything, haggis, slices of pizza, and the Mars bar. Frozen candy bars are battered and then deep fried, and often served with ice cream in some shops. Try it if you dare. Drop scones, similar to American pancakes, these are usually made sweet, with bits of date, raisins, sultanas, or other fruit inside. I've occasionally seen cheese scones as well. Edinburgh Rock, this is a rock candy sold on the streets of Edinburgh. Mind your teeth. Finnan Hatties, a smoked haddock that originated in the Aberdeen fishing village of Finden. Forfar Bridey, a small meat pastry or pie, similar to a Welsh pasty. Meat and vegetables are placed on one side of a round pastry which is then folded in half, edges pinched closed, then baked until done. Red Grouse, a typical Highland game bird on many menus. August 12th is the start of the hunting season, so if you are in Scotland on the glorious 12th, watch for it. Highland Oatcakes, these thick, tasty oatcakes are similar to thick crackers and are a great base to serve with a bit of butter, honey, or jam spread on them. Lock Fine Kippers, kippers are sort of like larger sardines, not as salty, and often served warm with breakfast. Neeps and Taddies, the traditional name for rutabaga, turnips, and potatoes, usually a mixed mashup of the two, with some spices and cream folded in. Porridge, oatmeal served often for breakfast, sometimes with cream, butter, or sultanas. Tablet, essentially, this is a firmer type of Scottish fudge which has a much higher sugar content than American fudge. Scotch pie, a double-crusted, meat and vegetable-filled pie. Similar to English pork pies. Seaweed, several different sorts of seaweed is now being added to cheese, salads, and other treats on Scottish menus. Shortbread, Scotland is famous for its shortbread, and you can find tins of it for sale everywhere, from gift shops to the supermarket, and even in petrol stations in their convenience store. The tins are famous for their romanticized Highlander images on the lid. Some of the places we had some fantastic meals in Scotland included takeaways, ethnic restaurants, pubs, and higher-end places. One such place was Krishi's, an Indian restaurant in Edinburgh. This is a full-service Indian restaurant with wonderful garlic naan and lamb sag. A note of caution, though, if you are tempted to try urn brew, see below under drinks, don't try it after eating garlic naan. This is not a favorable taste combination. Indian restaurants are very popular in both England and Scotland, as England ruled over India for many years. During that time, many Indians emigrated to the British Isles and made lives there. They brought their spices and palates to awaken local sensibilities to the wonders of Indian food. Moving farther north, Craig's Bar in Grandtown on Spey is great for an evening of pints and pies. They have lovely pies. Such options, minty lamb pie, smoky joe pie with potatoes, spinach, cream and mushrooms, chicken of Aragon pie, or the Heidi pie with goat's cheese, sweet potato, spinach, garlic and onion. They also have dozens of whiskeys to try. They take several and list descriptions on the blackboard each night, so you can decide if you want to try a peaty, oaky, or salty whiskey that evening. Or all three. The owners are true characters, Robbie and his mother, who was about to head to China for the Olympics on her own, staying in youth hostels. Farther north, if you are near Inverness, drive down the A82 towards Loch Ness. In possibly the only case in Scotland where there is a sign before the establishment appears, look for the Oakwood Restaurant. This place is run by a Scottish man and his French wife, she cooks, he makes wonderful rustic picnic tables. We had chicken breasts stuffed with haggis in a blackcurrant reduction and deer meat goulash. Cranican and whiskey slash honey creme brulee for dessert. If you make it up to Orkney and need some great food late at night, try Dilse, the Indian restaurant near the library. Their biryani is fantastic, as is their Roshni lamb. On the Isle of Lewis, in the main town of Stornoway, there is an Indian restaurant called Bolty House, just at the south end of the frontage road.
The folks who run it grew up in Aberdeen, and it is odd hearing Hindi and then English in a Scottish accent, but the food was fantastic. I had the chili garlic lamb, and Jay had the chicken tikka curry. It was spicy, but not hot, lots of flavor, very tender. Moving on to the Isle of Lewis, we had some great meals there, as well. In Stornoway, there is an Indian restaurant called Bolti House, the folks that run it are Indian and speak Hindi, and will then switch to English with an Aberdeen accent. The food is delicious, and the decor charming. On the Isle of Skye there is a fantastic place, called the Three Chimneys Restaurant, which earned a Michelin star in 2014. Yes, it is out in the middle of nowhere. Yes, it is expensive. However, it is worth it, even for my foodie husband. Our table was near the front window, we could look out at the bay during the meal. The wait staff was very attentive and helpful, and the food was simply superb. For starters, we had the seafood bisque, fennel soup, bright green, and roast pigeon. For the main meal, I had the roast lamb, which was lightly drizzled with a wonderfully savory slash sweet sauce. Dessert was a simple melt-in-your-mouth lemon sorbet parfait. The Selkirk Grace Attributed to Robert Burns, this small poem said before meals was already well known before Burns' time under other names. It is in Scots, traditionally, but I've provided both Scots and English for clarity. Scots Some hay meat and canna eat, and some what eat that want it, but we hay meat and we can eat, essay let the Lord be then kit. English Some have food and cannot eat, and some would eat that lack it, but we have food and we can eat, so let God be thanked. Drinks Bavrage, a natural raspberry drink made in Alo, Scotland with the aim of making available the taste of fresh raspberries all year round. The juice of one pound of Scottish raspberries is put into every 750 milliliters bottle. It's slightly sparkling, not too sweet and non-alcoholic. Cider, this is my drink of choice in any pub, as I prefer the sweet stuff. Cider in America, traditionally, is a thicker, cloudy version of apple juice, and non-alcoholic. In the UK and Ireland, cider is light, carbonated, and alcoholic. It ranges from dry to sweet, and available in just about any pub I've ever been to. It is just beginning to gain some traction in the US, I see it in some grocery stores and on some restaurants' menus. Bovril, this is sort of like a fortified, spiced broth, which can be served as a drink, as well as being added like concentrated stock to flavor soups and stews. It's also spread directly onto bread, similar to Marmite and Vegemite. Urn Brew, an almost neon orange carbonated soft drink. It leaves a warm tingling on the tongue like strong ginger ale. I must say that Urn Brew is an acquired taste. The first taste I loved, not so much after that. It tastes, to me, as if someone made a soda out of orange bublicious gum. It is, supposedly, named after the drink that iron workers would have after their shift, Iron Brew became Urn Brew. It is also one of the few sodas that outsell Coca-Cola in its area. Whiskey, ah, what can I saw about whiskey that isn't covered ad nauseum in many, many other books? Other than to say that whiskey, with an E, is Irish, while whiskey, without the E, is Scottish. See more information below, at the Whiskey Trail. Heather Ale, dates back to the 17th century, Leanne Freuch. With distillation become more widely spread, nearly anything aromatic was sampled in the process, including wild heather. Drambuie, the word drambuie is an old Scots Gaelic phrase, drambuthi, meaning the drink that satisfies. While the exact origin of this beverage isn't clear, one thing is that the McKinnon clan has had one hand or another in the making since around the 18th century, after the Battle of Culloden. The first commercial sales of the drink came in 1910 in Edinburgh. By 1916, it was the first liqueur to be allowed in the cellars of the House of Lords, and shortly thereafter enjoyed worldwide distribution. The Whiskey Trail 
While I shan't get into the debate as to whether Scotch whiskey or Irish whiskey is better, as I prefer cider, there is definitely plenty to see if you are a fan of the golden nectar. Many of Scotland's distilleries were established on Speyside, among the northern foothills of the Grampian Mountains. Eight of these distilleries, Benramac, Cardew, Dallas DHU Historic Distillery, Glenfiddich, Glen Grant, the Glenlivet, Glen Moray, Strathisla, and Speyside Cooperage, and one Cooperage, Barrel Makers, have come together under the banner of the Malt Whiskey Trail to offer visitors to the area the opportunity to experience firsthand the history and the process behind the production of one of the world's greatest drinks. All the distilleries listed are open to the public and there are details of each distillery. If you are in another area of Scotland, never fear. There are plenty of distilleries around the country, including those on the Isles of Islay, Skye, Mull, and Orkney, as well as Edinburgh and many other spots. Whiskey truly does give a sense of national pride and is part of the Scottish national identity. Sometime around the early 12th century, using distillation practices from the ancient Greeks, Babylonians, and medieval Arabs, wine was distilled by the Italians. This became incredibly popular in the medieval monasteries and was used as the base for many medicines. The art of this distillation process was spread to Ireland and Scotland and many other places by monks establishing new monasteries. The process moved to a secular setting by the Guild of Surgeon Barbers, medical practitioners of the time. The first evidence of whiskey production in Ireland was in 1405 at Clonmacnoise. The death of a chieftain was blamed on taking a surfeit of aqua vitae at Christmas. Scotland joined the party by 1494, where an order of malt was sent to Friar John C.O.R., by order of the king, to make aqua vitae. Ishki Baha is the Gaelic word for water of life. It was anglicized to whiskey in countries with an E in their name, such as the United States or Ireland, and whiskey to those without an E, such as Canada or Scotland. Plans and Mechanics When you plan a trip somewhere, there are all sorts of facets to your planning. Each facet requires your attention, and ignoring one could be potentially upsetting, inconvenient, or worse. This section should help with the practical aspects of planning and enjoying a trip to Scotland. Here are some of the things I shall cover. How do I plan a trip to Scotland? When do I go? How much will it cost? Where will I stay? How will I get around? What shall I visit? What if something goes wrong? Many dream about the magic of Scotland. However, many do not grab this dream, why not? It's too expensive, you say. I could never afford a trip to Europe. Less expensive than a week at Disney World, I say. For six people on a three-week Scotland vacation in June, 2008, including airfare, rental car, B&B accommodation and trip insurance, we spend about $2,600 per person. Yes, that's it. Now, this doesn't include food, petrol, gasoline, or souvenirs, of course, but it did include a wonderful vacation to a truly magical place. Also, Prices change all the time, especially for airfare. Any information I publish on hard airfare numbers will be obsolete by the time you read it, but I can and will give examples below. So, how do you get such a deal? Well, it takes patience, research, and the ability to make decisions when you need to. I will take you through, step by step, how to get the best deal for a Scottish vacation. Decisions, why? Who, what, where, when, and how. Why? You should start by thinking about why you want to go to Scotland. Do you want to touch the roots of your ancestors? Or experience an ancient culture? Have you always felt an unexplainable pull? Or do you just want to get away from the screaming kids or make your coworkers jealous? There are many reasons why you may want to go to Scotland. No need to pick one. Pick several. Use these reasons to help plan your trip. Who? WHO's going? You? 
your spouse, your children or parents, your best friend, a huge group of 20 friends. This decision makes a big difference in accommodation and transportation choices. I have learned, through trial and many errors, there are certain people who travel well together, and those who don't. For instance, I will no longer travel with a mixed group of friends, spouse, and or family. I have determined, in order to keep my sanity, I shall only travel with one type of companion at a time. Otherwise, I become a funnel through which all complaints about others are poured. Choose wisely to avoid problems. What? What to do? Are you interested in touring the whiskey distilleries? Ruined or restored castles and abbeys? Cities or charming villages? Your trip doesn't have to have a theme, of course, but it is more fun if you do, and helps you to plan when your mind is a blank. Perhaps you've seen a movie or read a book set in Edinburgh and want to visit the area? Or you dance and want to learn the Highland Fling, or you play an instrument and want to learn how to play the bagpipes? There is so much to see and do in Scotland that your imagination can take flight. Where? Where to go, of course, depends on what you are doing. It also ties into when you want to go. It probably needs to be considered as a package deal, so to speak. Where includes the character of place, towns and villages, or bustling city? Mountains or patchwork hills? Coastline or lockside? Each city has its own character and a variety of places to stay, from historic BNBS to luxury hotels. Scottish cities are compact so choose an accommodation with parking, as you won't need the car, as most things are within walking distance. Villages used as a base of exploration can be wonderful, and you get more chances to meet the locals. Urban, suburban, or rural, you will be spoiled for choice. More details on this decision are explored under why, below. When. When is an important consideration. While the weather is, on average, nicer in the summer and the days are longer, the trip will also be more expensive and more crowded. Alternatively, while the winter is cheaper and you have things more to yourself the weather is harsher, most traditional tourist attractions will be closed or some natural sites inaccessible in poor weather, and the days will be much shorter, an average of seven hours of daylight in fair weather. It is up to you to determine your comfort zone. The peak season is June, July, and August. The shoulder seasons of March, April, and May, and September, October, and November may offer the best of both worlds and is my preferred time for traveling. Except for right around Christmas and Easter, the winter months, December through February, offer the best deals, but also the highest possibility of weather difficulties and limited open attractions. How? How are you going to get there, and how will you get around once you are there? Usually, the easiest answer to the former question is via airplane. Airfare will be a good chunk of your travel budget, but with some research and patience, you can find a decent fare. Keep in mind that some websites quote the base fare with taxes and then have additional fees, so make sure you are comparing apples to apples when doing your research. While there are now regulations set to have the total fare, including taxes, displayed, that won't include baggage fees and other optional add-ons. There are several sites I go to in order to find comparable flights, such as the airlines themselves, but also Kayak and Google Flights. The cost is usually higher from smaller airports and from those farther away, such as California, as compared to East Coast departures and check the most direct flights to save on travel time and fewer connections, example, California to London Heathrow to Edinburgh, total flight time around 15 hours. Return the same route and you can clear customs in Heathrow. The latter question, of how to travel once you are on the ground, has more options. While my favorite, by far, is to rent my own car and wander around the moors and hills on my own, this is not the only option. You can travel to some of the main destinations by train or even by ferry or go via tour bus either an all-inclusive tour or shorter day trips. 
You can also hike or cycle. You can even combine methods of travel, example, drive to Oban and get the ferry to the Isles of Iona and Mole. Since COVID-19, costs of many things have gone up, so everything is still in flux. Rental cars, in particular, have skyrocketed due to companies selling off excess inventory during the pandemic. I recommend researching early, reserving early, and then keep checking to ensure you have a good deal. Renting a car The first thing to remember is that all rentals have compulsory insurances included in the rental rate. These minimum insurances include CDW, Collision Damage Waiver, VTP, Vehicle Theft Protection, LLI, Limited Liability Insurance, and Location Surcharges, as well as the cost of the rental itself and VAT, Value Added Tax. Understand what each of these insurances pay and consider optional insurances on collection, which include PLI or Personal Liability Insurance, SCDW or Super CDW, TPI or third-party insurance, and TNWC or tire and windscreen slash windshield coverage. CDW covers damages to the vehicle. Period. If you're in an accident, this compulsory insurance repairs or replaces the vehicle, most CDW coverage only pays up to 80 to 90 percent of damages and the renter covers the balance. SCDW is the same as CDW but covers that percentage which is left over from traditional CDW coverage. This covers 100% of the vehicle. If you're in an accident and there are injuries, LLI will pay medical costs for those injured if you hit another vehicle. It will not pay for those injured in your vehicle. PLI covers injured passengers in your vehicle. CDW slash SCDW and LLI slash PLI are often covered as part of your travel insurance package. If they are, you do not have to buy them again as part of the vehicle rental contract. Be sure to bring a copy of your travel insurance with you for proof on vehicle collection. TNWC is not a compulsory insurance but one you should consider adding on. As part of the standard rental contract, if you puncture a tire or a stone cracks the windscreen, you are responsible for repair, which can be as much as 100 pounds for a tire and 500 pounds for the windscreen. Adding on TNWC onto your contract will pay these damages so you don't have to. Read the fine print when getting rental quotes online. Some companies do include more than the basic insurances in their quote. Most credit cards issued in the U.S. will cover travel insurance on vehicles rented in Scotland. However, many of them have a value cap at $50,000 for the rented vehicle. This largely applies to luxury models. Depending on the size of car you rent and the exchange rate that day, it may be that the car you rent is over that cap, and thus the credit card will not cover it. Also, cars might be more expensive there than the same car would be here. Be prepared. If you do not have travel insurance coverage on your credit card, you might be able to buy it as part of your travel insurance. Check out Insure My Trip online to see your options. Also, if you get coverage from someone other than the rental company, be aware they may put either a hold on your credit card for several thousand pounds or actually charge a deposit to the card, which is refunded when you return the car in good order. While this sounds like the same thing, it is not, as many credit cards charge a 2-3% foreign transaction fee for any transaction. This would be charged twice for a deposit and a subsequent refund, so you would be out this fee twice. Do some research ahead of time to see if this is the policy of the rental agency, their rules can change at any time. Research Find out everything about everything, then throw half of it away. The internet is many things. Addicting, yes. Maddening, yes. But it is also incredibly helpful when doing research, especially about places far from your home. Airfare, accommodation, car rental, and destinations like cities, beautiful beaches, yes, they exist in Scotland, and gloomy castles are all listed somewhere, you just have to find them. The best order of research I've found is as follows. Make up a crazy wish list, anything you, and your traveling companions, have any interest in seeing. Decide which items are your must-sees, 
those places you have your heart set on. Plot out these must-sees on a map of Scotland. See if you can construct a basic progressive itinerary from those spots, incorporating the non-dash must-sees when you can, trying not to double back on yourself. See if you can find airfare in and out of places logical for the itinerary. Research accommodation along the way. Research ground transportation. The airfares available may define your itinerary somewhat, and the itinerary will help define other items. Just try staying flexible. Itinerary. There is a wealth of information online about places to see, castles and manor houses, museums and historical monuments, special interest workshops, battle sites, and many other places of interest. Most cities and towns, even villages, have their own website with tourist information. In addition, many travel agent websites have great information for the intrepid traveler. Even more, there are websites dedicated to those interested in travel, with wonderful forums for those odd questions. Some of my favorites are listed in the Maps and Resources section at the back of this book. Once you have done exhaustive research of the places you want to see, throw half of it out. Yes, that's right, you will likely end up with a list of 17 things to see in each location, but you will only have time for a third of them, so pick your favorites. I usually list about twice as many as I can possibly see and bold the ones I really want to see. That way, if, for some reason, I have extra time, say, one of my must-sees was closed, or didn't take as long as I had thought it would, I can see some of my second-string choices. Also, do yourself a favor by leaving room in your itinerary for free time, wandering around and getting lost, people watching at a cafe, or just having a pint with the locals. These are usually the most memorable parts of your trip, so leave time for them. You don't want to end up with an itinerary where you are rushing through things so fast you don't see them. I call this the plaid blur tour. While some people prefer a fast-paced vacation, it does sometimes pay off to stop and enjoy what you are seeing, rather than just marking off things you've seen on a checklist, like the Griswolds in European Vacation. Edinburgh Castle? Check! Loch Ness? Check! If you've got the places listed you want to see, look for a pattern. Are they all close to a central location? If so, pick places where you can stay multiple nights and use them as bases of exploration around those regions. Or can they be strung together in a circle over a larger region? If so, spend a couple nights in each place, moving around that circular route. Be visual, pay attention to road maps, plan wisely, and try to avoid crisscrossing or backtracking. Check driving times between places with via Michelin or Google Maps. Then add about 25% to those driving times, as mapping programs don't take into account Scottish roads. They twist and turn, which can keep speeds down lower than the actual posted speed limit. There are hills and valleys, sheep and cattle, tractors and tour buses, and even roadworks. You don't want to spend all of the time driving, trust me. It gets very tiring, especially as you will likely be driving a manual transmission, which are the majority rental cars available, automatics are available at a higher cost. I try keeping my driving time to around 3 hours at the most and break it up with stops at attractions along the way. I find the most reliable way to figure a distance and time is to multiply the miles by 35 miles per hour to get an average travel time. Example, if I need to travel 50 miles to my next accommodation, at the average speed limit of 35 miles per hour, the drive alone will take approximately an hour and a half. Add on to this time, the time it takes to get to attractions, then add some additional time for stopping for lunch, photo opportunities, and exploring the side streets and quaint shops. What does that sign say? Let's see where it goes. If you enlist in a travel agent to help you design an itinerary, be sure to ask about the agent's personal experience in Scotland. It's quite common for agents to sell custom itineraries but actually never having visited Scotland themselves and thus do not have any real experience. Be sure to work with a professional who specializes in Scottish travel and has hands-on experience and knowledge as a local would. 
airfare. This is usually the biggest chunk of your travel budget. There is a definite season to vacationing in Scotland, summer. While many people do go on the peak months of June, July and August, there is indeed a reason why summer is the best. The days are longer to see sights, warmer weather, less rain and wind, and everything is open. This also means the airfare is the most expensive, as well as hotels. Smaller accommodation, like BNBS and Goose Houses, have much the same rates year-round. The shoulder months of March, April, and May, and September, October, and November are becoming more popular, as the weather is still usually decent, and the days aren't incredibly short yet. However, this also means the airfares are creeping up as these become more popular times to travel. Please note some places won't be open in the shoulder and off seasons, many BNBs, some restaurants, and most attractions may close after October and remain closed until mid-March. If you are in doubt, check the attraction's website first to see if your must-see sites are open before making definitive plans. Most sites list daily opening hours, as well as open seasons. When I've decided on what I want to see and where I want to stay, I look for the most convenient airports, then I start researching my flights. I go to dozens of websites, sometimes daily, to watch fares before buying. When I have traveled to Scotland, I found good fares on a one-day fare sale through United Airlines, which I only knew about due to a fare alert email I had signed up for. The fare was gone in an hour, but I had pounced on it and got it. Do your research. There are deals out there. Also consider flying into one city and out of another. This is great for Scotland, as you can fly into Edinburgh, explore up the east coast and end up flying out of Glasgow at the end of your trip. This is called an open jaw ticket and usually doesn't cost much more, if any, than a normal round trip ticket. Keep in mind, though, that Glasgow and Edinburgh are only one hour's drive from each other, so it may not be a huge savings in time. There are shuttles available to take you from one airport to the other for a reasonable price. We used one on our trip, landing in Glasgow, and then taking a bus which transported all six of us to our front door in the Edinburgh flat we had rented, about an hour and a half drive. Total cost, about £100. There are others, of course, but these are the ones I've used most often. Also don't forget to check the airline websites, if you find a great fare on Expedia for Delta, Delta might have it cheaper on their own site, and it is usually better to deal directly rather than through a middleman. Some airlines, like Southwest, which isn't international, but could get you to a hub like New York cheaper, may not be listed on price consolidation sites like Travelocity, Kayak, or Expedia. Check those sites on your own. I sign up for airfare alerts when I'm researching fares, so I get quick notification of sales. Airfare Watchdog is a great place to keep track of a particular fare, as the site follows fares rise and fall. You can set up email alerts for when the price rises or drops a particular amount or to a particular level. Some of the consolidation websites do this as well. When you buy your tickets, check out the cancellation policies. Usually, the cheaper the flight, the less flexible the change is allowed. Make sure you are going before you purchase non-refundable, no-change tickets. If you have any reason why you might not be able to make the flight, either pay extra for flexible tickets or get travel insurance that covers flight cancellation. Some fares cover delays or cancellations due to medical reasons, for instance. Keep in mind they usually mean your medical reason, not a child or a parent for whom you need to stay to take care of. Airlines are very strict about cancellations so be sure to read the fine print before buying your tickets. Accommodation Bed and breakfasts and goose houses Once you have your airfare and itinerary, you know which nights you need accommodation and where. Scotland is wonderfully full of adorable bed and breakfasts, I highly recommend this accommodation choice. The BNBS in the US tend to be more upscale and expensive than those in the Scotland, so don't go by their example. Most BNBS I've ever been in have been comfortable, clean, cozy, and a delight to stay. 
BNBS around the countryside run around 40 pounds per person sharing per night or PPPN or PPS and include the traditional full Scottish breakfast. You will pay higher for city goose houses. Where BNBS are generally family homes, larger goose houses are purpose built BNBS with higher occupation numbers, perhaps more amenities, and a more extensive breakfast menu, and will have a slightly higher cost. If you are staying in the city, and have more than just a couple people, it may be more economical to rent a flat or an apartment. We had six in Edinburgh and rented a lovely two story flat just a block off the Royal Mile. It had a total of four bedrooms, had the original wood floors from the 15th century, vaulted ceilings, and a lovely wooden four-poster bed. The dining room was a bit claustrophobic, for all it looked like a medieval dining hall, and the clothes washer and dryer were compact, but it was a great place to get our bearings and a short walk to the medieval heart of the city. Hotels Hotels usually charge by room rather than per person but are based on two people sharing. Many usually do not include breakfast in the deal, referred to on booking as room only. Hotels are usually more cookie-cutter and sterile. A Hilton is the same in San Francisco as it is in New York, London, and Japan, and they lack the authenticity of a family-run B&B. In my opinion, hotels are a place to stay based on convenience rather than a place to enjoy. However, there are some small family-run hotels in rural areas which may offer you the privacy you want while also adding something interesting to your overall visit to Scotland. Many old country houses have been converted to goose houses and small hotels, which would definitely add interest to your stay in the region, especially if the accommodation has any historic ties to local history. You can also find castle hotels around the country, such as Colcrook Castle in Stirlingshire or Dalhousie Castle near Edinburgh. Prices in these types of accommodations are generally more expensive but would certainly add something special to your trip, especially if you're traveling to Scotland for a special event, like an anniversary or honeymoon. Hostels and other specialist accommodation Hostels, both regular hostels and youth hostels, camping, caravanning, RV, canal boats, colleges offering dormitory rooms for the summer, are other options for creative accommodation. There is no end of unusual places to stay. Some hostels in Scotland are part of old castles, such as Castle Rock Hostel. There are some churches and monasteries that are now BNBS. Get creative. Self-catering. Self-catering houses are also an option, especially if you have a large group or prefer the privacy of a home-from-home -home type of accommodation. The biggest downfall is many require a seven-day minimum stay, usually from Saturday to Saturday. Some are willing to do short breaks, though, so always check. Once you have decided where you want to stay, make a reservation. Make sure to check the cancellation policies with all accommodations you book. Most BNBS and Goose houses require a 24 to 48 hour cancellation, and many hotels can be canceled the morning of arrival. However, self catering and specialty accommodation usually have a four to six week cancellation period for a full refund. The time you cancel will dictate how much of your money you get back. Inside that four to six week period means staged refunds, with service charges increasing the closer to your reservation date. Email is usually the normal option for communication these days. I prefer this method as it leaves a paper trail, and I make sure to bring a copy with me. Not everyone in Scotland is web savvy, even if they have a website, so be patient. Some may require a phone call, most will require a credit card to secure bookings, even if it's not charged. This protects the establishment against no-shows. Don't forget the time difference. Scotland is ahead of Eastern Standard Time by 5 hours and by 8 hours from Pacific Standard Time. Noon in New York and 9 a.m. in San Francisco is 5 p.m. in Scotland. If you're organizing your trip in the evening after work, remember the folks in Scotland could be asleep. Also, when booking your accommodation, not all places in Scotland are going to take credit cards. Those which do may not take American Express or Diners Club. None of them take Discover. 
Those which take credit cards will take MasterCard and Visa. Some are cash only, even if they take a card number for the reservation. Be prepared to pay cash on departure. If a host is going to take a deposit or take the full amount on booking, remember you will see a foreign transaction fee on your statement. Again, check the cancellation policy if you expect a refund on cancellation. Ground transportation. My recommendation for getting around Scotland is definitely by renting a car, as discussed earlier. Exceptions would be if you are under or over the age limit for rentals, or maybe you have physical limitations, or if you are staying in a major city, like Edinburgh or Glasgow where you won't need a car because the city is compact enough to walk and parking is hard to find and expensive. In the countryside, though, while it is possible to use bus and train to get around, and certainly many people do, you won't find this an easy option, as it requires a lot of flexibility in your schedule. ScotRail travels between cities and major towns, but a vast part of the country has no rail travel at all. Getting to villages and remote attractions can be difficult to impossible and very time-consuming. If you are in an organized bus tour, you are obliged to stick to that itinerary, so you can't make a detour on a whim to go find a hidden castle when you see a sign. You can't stay longer at one spot unless you want to get left behind. There is no flexibility with organized tours. If you travel by public bus, you do have some flexibility in your itinerary, but you will be reliant on the bus schedule, which is often inconsistent for arrival and departure times. Now, I know it is scary to think about driving on the wrong side of the road, but it's not really that difficult, especially if you're a good, conscientious driver by nature. It's not so bad as you think, and you will get used to it very quickly. The mind has an incredible ability to mirror and allow you to perform the same tasks, as if mirroring the motions to what you're used to. It helps to have a designated navigator, as the signage in Scotland is a little different from what you may be used to. Signs tell you name of the next town, in English and in Scottish Gaelic, as well as the route number and the distance in miles to other towns on that route. This means you should know the major towns on the way to where you are going, or even the ones just beyond your destination. While national signs can be in both English and Gaelic, keep in mind that the more north you get into the highlands, the signs might only be in Gaelic, so learn the local name of the places. Most folks have map apps on their smartphones. If you don't, or if you don't have a data plan that you can use abroad, you a GPS can still be very helpful, and not only does it help you find places, if you have a good address for the place, not always a given, especially in rural areas. It can definitely help you find your way back to your BNB if you deliberately get lost during the day, just for the fun of it. Most car rental companies offer them now, some of them even give them for free. Big cities in Scotland don't require a car to get around. In fact, having a car is a liability in Edinburgh. It is difficult to get around with the heavy traffic, find parking is challenging unless you know where the few multi-story parking lots are, and it can be expensive both on the street and in the multi-story. Also, Edinburgh and Glasgow both have decent public transportation systems, and both cities are quite walkable. Smaller towns and villages, even those like Perth and Inverness, are very walkable as well, so parking for the afternoon and exploring the town by foot is usually the best option. For the bigger cities, if it's your final stop before returning home, turn in the car before getting to the city, or wait to rent it until you leave to begin your holiday. Gasoline is called petrol in Scotland, gas is the natural stuff pumped into your home, and is very expensive. At the time of this publication, the cost is running around 8 US dollars per gallon. Yes, really. The good news is you can usually get around 45 miles per gallon from economy size cars, larger cars get slightly lower miles per gallon. However, filling up a tank can still run you $100 or more, so budget accordingly. Remember the itinerary you made with estimated driving times? Use the mileage from that and double it. Yes, double it. You will be going to places, taking day trips, going out for dinner, stopping at brown sign sites, all sorts of side trips. 
I've gotten decent deals from Auto Europe and from Enterprise Rental. I would advise against renting from a place you've never heard of. Cars can be very expensive, and it is difficult to fight a fraudulent damage claim from overseas. Having said that, there are a number of privately owned rental companies who have been in business as many as 50 years. See more on the details and problems of renting a car above in the ground transportation section. Other considerations. Okay, you've done your research, gotten your airline tickets, made your reservations for accommodation, and your car rental. Ready to go? Not yet. Travel insurance. You break your leg the week before the trip. Ruined. All your money lost. Not so, grasshopper, if you bought the proper travel insurance. Go to insure my trip and compare the benefits of different packages. Find out if your own health insurance will cover you on foreign soil. Some credit cards also have built-in travel insurance. Look for things like cancellation insurance in case of medical emergency, reimbursement for lost luggage, additions to the above-mentioned car insurance, etc. Compare the benefits between what you already pay for and what you need to travel and find a travel plan which fits right for your needs. For a small investment, you get a great deal of peace of mind. Passports and visas All most people need to travel to Scotland is a valid passport from their country of origin. Also, be sure there are no impediments that would cause you to be refused entry, such as a felony record. This should be taken care of before you even buy your tickets. Normal processing times for a new passport is six weeks, but please give it plenty of leeway, especially if you've already bought non-refundable tickets. This can increase to about 12 weeks without notice. Don't procrastinate. My husband ended up getting his passport the morning we flew out. We were very nervous, to say the least. U.S. citizens don't need visas for visits of up to 90 days in Scotland, but if you are going somewhere else or staying longer, do read up on the requirements long before your flight and make sure all paperwork is in order. Money Scotland uses the British pound sterling for its currency. The exchange rate fluctuates every day, of course, but it tends to be somewhere between $1.20 and $1.40 per one pound. Cash I recommend going to your bank and getting a couple hundred dollars worth of sterling as travel money for the day you land. You can get more during your stay from the ATM and or use your credit card for purchases. You can also get some pre-trip sterling online through companies like AAA or Thomas Cook or order it from your bank. Alternatively, larger airports have bureau to change desks where you can exchange your money for sterling. Keep in mind the exchange rate is higher in the airport for the convenience. Traveler's Checks Never travel with large amounts of cash. Traveler's checks were an option for many years, but now, you'd be hard-pressed to find any place that accept or exchange them. Just. Don't. ATMs in Scotland Be sure your bank is part of the link system to access your account in Scotland. Also, you will not be given a choice between linked accounts. Your ATM card will only have access to your primary account from Scotland, which is often your checking account. You may wish to save hassle while in Scotland by opening a dedicated travel account and getting a new ATM card for that account, and make sure any and all travel funds you wish to access are in that account. Also, keep in mind that many smaller towns and villages won't have an ATM. You may have to travel to a larger town nearby to get cash. I've also noticed some ATMs, often the only one in town, are inside stores, so if the store is closed, so is access to cash. However, as more gas stations open which are parts of small convenience shops, small ATM machines in the back of the shops are often installed. Plan accordingly if you're traveling into a remote area, and keep in mind that banks are closed after 4 p.m. weekdays and all day on the weekends, and in the remotest areas, may have sparse hours. Credit cards. Be sure to contact your bank prior to travel to let them know to expect charges made in Scotland during your travel dates. This will, hopefully, save you the hassle of having your card put on hold 
or worse, canceled, mid-trip and leaving you without your card. Sometimes their fraud department will still put a hold on, but a phone call can often clear this up. If you don't have a credit card, or your interest rate is too high, shop around for a card with a good rate. Many, Capital One is one of the few which don't add on an extra 2% for any foreign transaction in addition to the 1% Visa slash MC charges. You don't want to carry too much cash with you, but some BNBS, while preferring cash even if they take credit cards, require reservations made guaranteeing the booking with a credit card to protect them against no-shows. Before you travel, you can also set up a prepaid debit card that is based on sterling and use it throughout the trip, including getting cash from the ATM. I've heard of some issues with American credit cards that use six-digit pins in the UK which only uses four digits. Be sure your card uses a four-digit pin and avoid those problems. The UK, including Scotland, have now changed over to a chip and pin format for all credit cards and laser slash ATM cards. While the machine in most shops takes both chip and pin and swipe cards, shop staff may not have been trained how to use the swiper or how to manually enter the card number. You may need to ask for a manager to complete your charge. Packing Sure, you've packed dozens of times for vacations. What's the big deal? Well, the flight luggage restrictions for carry-on and checked luggage, for one. Airlines have lots of rules, so it behooves you to know them before you get to the airport. Carry-on, most airlines have their carry-on rules on their websites. Some have weight as well as size restrictions. Airlines differ, but you may find your carry-on must fit under the seat in front of you, even if you intend on putting it in the overhead compartment, and it must not weigh more than around 15 to 20 pounds. Liquid restrictions also need to be obeyed. Check before you go. Right now, any carry-on liquids must be in containers no larger than 3 ounces, 100 milliliters, and they must all fit comfortably in a quart-sized clear Ziploc bag. Liquids include gels and semi-solid things roll-on deodorant and toothpaste, so do be careful. When in doubt and you absolutely don't need it for your flight, check it in your luggage or leave it at home. Jackets and medical equipment, like CPAP machines, are not counted toward your carry-on limits, though cameras and laptop computers are. I've taken heavy things from my carry-on and put them in my purse, which is rarely weighed. You can also stuff the pockets of the jacket. I packed some of my heavy electronic stuff, like chargers and batteries, into my CPAP machine case. It's highly recommended you carry prescriptions with you rather than putting them in your checked luggage. In the event your luggage gets misdirected, you will still have your medication. Prescription medicines must be labeled in the traveler's name. Be sure to get your doctor to write out a copy of your prescription and carry it with you in a safe place. If you lose your medication, bring your prescription to a chemist to have refilled. You may also find that if you're carrying baby food or formula that it may need to be tested at the gate. Where adult food is concerned, you will be asked at security to dispose of things like uneaten food and open bottles and cans of water or colas. Visit the Transport Security Administration, TSA, website for lists of acceptable carry-ons and restrictions. This list will also help you to know what you can bring on board to entertain yourself or your kids, such as electronic games, music players, laptops, tablets, e-readers, etc. The site will also provide you with information on things like knitting needles, crochet hooks, scissors, etc. Keep in mind that even if it's on the TSA acceptance list, it's purely up to the discretion of the officers at security. Don't bring your expensive needles and hooks in the event they're not allowed and you have to throw them away. Checked luggage Some airlines charge hefty fees for overweight luggage and limit the number of pieces each person can check. While airline restrictions vary, generally speaking, for long-haul flights into the UK, the maximum weight allowance is about 50 pounds and some airlines can allow up to two 50-pound suitcases per person. Also, if you're in the habit of locking your suitcases, be sure to use TSA-approved locks. 
If inspectors need to access your suitcases for any reason, they have a master key to open those locks, or they will cut off non-TSA locks to inspect. If there is an inspection, you'll know when you get home to unpack and find an inspection notice on top of your items. TSA-approved locks are available in most travel sections in department stores and travel shops, as well as stores like Target, Walmart, etc. Don't, don't, don't put valuables or medicines in your checked luggage. I cannot emphasize this enough, yet people do it every day. Cameras, laptops, anything fragile, anything essential, must go in your carry-on. They've even created a reality show based on people buying up abandoned and lost luggage, hoping for hidden treasure inside. Of course, this makes your carry-on heavy, so some decision-making is sometimes necessary, as you've seen above, there are strict weight limits for carry-ons. I usually put one day's worth of clean clothes in my carry-on, in case the checked luggage is delayed or lost. If you have something really valuable, consider leaving it at home. Do you really need the diamond stud earrings on the trip, or will the cubic zirconia work? My last trip, I did carry on only for the 16-day trip. I've had the airlines lose my luggage too many times in the past. On my trip to Scotland in 2008, my baggage was delayed for five days. Luckily, I had a change of clothes and most of my required paperwork, so it was okay, even if annoying. Bring a soft-sided carry-on or luggage, as it will likely expand with the things you buy on your trip. Some are expandable with zippered sides. Or just bring an extra duffel bag to check on the way back. It's much less annoying to wait five days for your dirty clothes to arrive home than it is for your clean clothes to arrive on vacation. Jet lag. The bane of travelers. Many people suffer from jet lag when they travel across time zones. If you are in the eastern U.S., you will be five hours ahead in Scotland. If you are from the western U.S., that increased to eight hours. While everyone's body reacts differently, here are some tips that I've followed or heard in the past that might help. Hydrate. Drink plenty of water during your flights. This helps keep your body functioning normally and reduces travel stress. Drinking alcohol can make the problem worse, so go easy on the cocktails, as they can dehydrate you. Sleep. If you can sleep on the overnight trip, do so. Even if it is only a couple of hours, this will help. I usually use earplugs and eye shades to block noise and light. I try not to sleep very much the night before the flight, so I sleep better on the plane. Your mileage may vary. Routine, I tend to go to bed an hour earlier for each of the three days before my trip. For instance, if I normally go to bed at 10 p.m., I will go at 9 p.m. three days before my flight, 8 p.m. two days before, 7 p.m. the night before, waking earlier each morning until the day of departure. That way, your body is a little more acclimatized to your new schedule, resulting in a smaller jolt once you arrive. Activity When you do wake up, make sure to try to get some sunshine first thing. This wakes up your body and lets your circadian rhythm settle in. The day I arrive, I usually make sure to do things all day and try to avoid napping. Occasionally I give in, but make sure it's only an hour or two. I don't plan anything heavy, like a two-hour drive or climbing a mountain. Light activity, some sightseeing, walking around the town. Then I usually crash around 9 p.m. and sleep like the dead. The next morning, I'm bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to tackle the world. Getting into your normal sleep pattern right away helps. Wake at your normal time and go to bed at your normal time. Even on arrival day. Sugar levels, invariably, my husband has a sugar crash halfway through the second day of the trip. We keep regular meal times and top up with power bars to counter any problems. Your body goes through a lot of stress through travel, especially if you are older or have muscular slash metabolic issues, such as diabetes or fibromyalgia. Plan accordingly and make sure you have supplies on hand to combat them. Ready to go? Don't forget the smile. Don't forget to pack the most important thing for any trip, 
a great attitude. This small item can make the worst disaster into a hilarious story and get you through a difficult situation with authorities and can take the biggest lemon and make lemonade out of it. After all, how can it be terrible? You're in Scotland. A trip to Scotland will be full of wonderful memories, historic experiences, and meeting wonderful folks. Whether you get addicted like I have or are happy with going once and treasuring the memory forever, you will have an exquisite time.